It's easy to hear your favorite artist on WFPK from wherever you are. Listen on your smart speaker, live stream from our website at WFPK.org from Louisville Public Media. Consequence Podcast Network. Hey, and welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with. It's the interview series presented by WFPK and WFPK.org, Consequence, and the Consequence Podcast Network. Thanks, as always, for making your way here, checking out the series. You know what to do by now. If you like what you see and what you hear, hit that subscribe button. I put out three brand new interviews every single week. New and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So it's a great way to keep up with your favorite artists, to discover some new ones. You can do so at all the usual spots, including Spotify and Apple Podcasts at NPR, WFBK.org, YouTube for the video versions, or anywhere you get your podcast from, you can subscribe to Kyle Meredith with. In fact, a few of the recent episodes that you can find, uh, Victony, we had uh, Emily Kenny on here. She was in The Walking Dead. She's also a singer-songwriter, got a new album out, had actress Elizabeth Perkins and Ellie Kemper. Dylan Arnold stopped by to talk about uh, Oppenheimer. He play, uh, portrayed Frank Oppenheimer, had the cast of Minx. Uh, Bruno Major, Greta Van Fleet, Pearl Jam, Lucinda Williams, Ian Hunter. Those are just a few of the recent episodes you can find when you subscribe to Kyle Meredith with. And that's me, Kyle Meredith. Today, it's a special episode. It's the 800th episode. That would have been better if I'd had some reverb on it. I, uh, I ran out. I, I used all my quota for reverb. Couldn't, couldn't afford any more reverb. So that's what you get. You get a dry 800th episode. Uh, we're going to be looking back at the previous 100 episodes, all the stuff we've done since episode 700, and uh, I picked out some of the favorites that we're going to cruise through and uh, and revisit along. Uh, that includes conversations and interviews I've had with uh, Josh Homme of Queens of the Stone Age, Janelle Monet, Keanu Reeves and his band Dogstar, Suki Waterhouse. We got to talk about not only her music, but uh, her portrayal in Daisy Jones and the Six. Rob Lowe stopped by, actress Monica Bellucci and Arnold Schwarzenegger, all within the last 100th episode. So you're going to be uh, hearing from all of them again. If you've heard those interviews before, you're going to enjoy the revisit. And if you have not, this is going to be a nice preview so you can do the deep dives whenever you see fit. Uh, So without further ado, why not? uh, Let's just jump into this. Kyle Meredith with the 800th episode. And we're going to start with uh, Josh Homme. It wasn't actually too long ago that we recorded this one. Uh, June 14th, it was uh, it, it dropped. And uh, so Queens of the Stone Age, they're back with a brand new record called In Times New Roman that we got to talk about. It was their first release since uh, 2017. And this was just kind of a magical conversation. I've had Josh on the series a few times over the years, and it's always such an interesting thing where... As an interviewer, you, you know you, you, one, one of the some of the rules, some of the key things. You, you know, you got to listen. You have to listen and just be prepared to go wherever that the uh, the interviewee might feel like going. Uh, otherwise, you know, hands up, take the will, uh, and that's kind of what it's like talking with Josh Homme. You, you have a rough outline of things you, you're probably going to be talking about, but you got to be prepared to throw those out and just kind of follow him wherever he goes. And that's what we did. We talked about stereotypes. We talked a lot about existence, just what happens to us maybe after. Why are we even here? That's in it a lot. And uh, Gallo's humor, a part of it as well. So here's, uh, here's, here's how we kick it off. Episode 800, revisiting my conversation. It's Kyle Meredith with Josh Homme. Look, we're soundtracking our lives here and and uh when it's bitching it's at the vanguard of like oh my god wait you gotta hear this you won't believe what's gonna happen so there's something about saying you won't believe what's gonna happen at the beginning of the story that says oh my god reality is crazy it's crazy it's 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 unimaginable but so true right and i just look i'm making i'm soundtracking my own life and i uh i want to do a good job I want to. I want it to be real. That's why the brutality of the sonic side of this record and the lyric side is. That's why it's like that because life is nuts. I'm just noticing it. I'm standing next to you, like, wow. Consider my tiny mind blown. I get to do this for a living, so I'm going to do it full on. You know, pry my guitar out of my cold dead hand. I think Charlton Heston said that. 
could the fact that you exist all be to service the furtherance of nothing? Religion is born of this notion, but it doesn't answer this notion. Um, are you here to service the proof of nothing? I don't care about the earthly interpretations of why and what. There's life's big questions. I, I can answer one of them. Why are we here? Because you are, so you better get started. This is all I'll ever get. I need to make sure that, that we're good right now because there's nothing else to do. And I'm okay with that. You know, you don't need to do anything. What, what you need to do is move at the speed of inspiration and pursue what's worth going after. To take a calculated risk is all that I see in life. And the people that eat peanuts and throw the shells into the ring, they mean nothing. They are nothing. What can you do, man? You know, I, I um, what can you do? Because when you're a kid, you, you try to revolt against your parents and you find your thing and you pick your ice cream flavor and you make a, a little fence around it. And you're like, no one else licks Rocky Road. You're trying to identify yourself in this cavalcade of static. And this is what you must do. And then all of a sudden, quickly, if you're in your mid to late 20s and you're not realizing that genre is for teenagers and people who work at a record store, you're in a big trouble. Like, I don't have guilty pleasures because I don't feel bad, right? I'm, I'm in the pursuit of what I care about, and I think you are too. And so I listen to Chet Baker, and I listen to Astro Gilberto and Stan Getz and Fuau Gilberto, and I, Nilsson Schmilson, I, who am I to pretend I couldn't like Britney Spears Toxic? I, what am I, a fool? That was just a, uh, a few weeks after I talked with Josh Homme that Janelle Monet stopped by. Uh, I got to tell you, I had been wanting to talk to Janelle Monet since the Arc Android came out, which was, what, 2010, 2011, somewhere, somewhere in there. I've been such a fan. And then after she blows us away with her music, she becomes this amazing actor as well. Uh, you know, and, and most recently, of course, we saw her in uh, Glass Onion just late last year. And she's got a, uh, another one coming up. She's uh, starring as Josephine Baker in uh, A24's upcoming De La Resistance. Uh, so we got to talk about all that and more. It's uh, a flashback to Kyle Meredith with Janelle Monet. You know, I wrote this album with friends and, and I felt super safe enough to sort of explore more parts of, of who I am as an, as an artist. And that moment after like talking to them and listening to it just represented taking everybody along with me you know, as I transformed and, and gave myself permission to enter this age of pleasure, you know, a, 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 per, a personal moment that you guys were witness, witnessing as I ushered into this age of pleasure, you know, where we are and, and uh, giving myself permission to tap in, you know, even further. It was me re literally trying to find the note, find how I was going to say something. And um, sometimes that's important. Sometimes process of how somebody gets to become who they are or realizing you know, who they are is important to see. Well, we shot everything. You're probably talking about how we shot everything on uh, film, eight millimeter, 16 millimeter. And that was important for me for Brown and Black folks to have that documented in that way. Because when I go back and I look at the 50s and 60s and I look at what was caught of us on camera, it was a lot of um, violence against our bodies and not in this age of pleasure, not today. You know, we are, we, we are in our joy. You see us in our joy and that was important. You see us in a safe space. You see us free of police. You see us free of the heaviness that is going on uh, in the world. And, you know, we honor our past, um, but we also create a, a future. And, and um, as somebody who thinks about the next generation, it's joy. I wanted to document that joy, that joy of dancing, that joy of freedom for us, that joy of liberation for us. Yeah, Josephine Baker. I owe her so much. She's such a such an incredible, dynamic Black woman who gave so much and, and was super liberated. She definitely would have been at our parties and we would have been at hers, you know, had we been in the same time. You know, we'll, we'll speak about her as a spy. You know, she spoke five languages. She was, you know, not just a singer, entertainer, actor. 
dancer. You know, she was somebody who really, really cared about the community. She was liberated during the time where women, let alone Black women, could behave in that way, you know. And I will say her pet cheetah is intriguing to me. So we got to see, like, <laughs> how she lived. Like, she owned a Chateau and a Bugatti and you know, she was bisexual and she was just super free. Like, uh, talk about like a pioneer. Like that was her and, and seeing her in that era in Paris and, you know, getting 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 to, to sink my teeth into that role. Like it's going to be a challenge, but in the best possible way. And we'll be right back right after this. Welcome back. It's Kyle Meredith with the 800th episode. Now, one of the most recent uh, interviews that I've done in this uh, most recent 100 episodes that's led to the 800 episode uh, just came out in uh, in July and featured the band Dogstar. Now, Dogstar features Keanu Reeves, Brett Domrose, and Robert Melhouse. Uh, They started as a band in the 90s. Uh, They broke up about 20 years ago. They've gotten together privately just to jam. They're all still friends, but of course, all the lives got very busy with acting, especially with Mr. Reeves. And, uh, and and so now it's taken till now to, to put more music out. They've got a full-length album on the way called Somewhere Between the Power Lines and Palm Trees. And, uh, and even though it's a recent interview, let's revisit this one as one of my favorites of the past uh, 100, uh, Kyle Meredith with Dogstar. It's been fun. It's been really creative. And for me, it's super special to be able to play music with these guys and yeah, I mean, that, for me, that's part of, you know, as we kind of were playing over the years and formally, it was cool just in the past, you know, few years to like, you know, we've all changed a lot, but there's a lot of us, a lot of about us that's the same, but there's also a lot different, you know, and I think musically and, you know, more time with the instrument and, and it's been, uh, so it was just really cool just to see the kind of present, where are we now? You know, we, we've been kind of getting together throughout the years you now, starting like in 2010 and 11. It's just sort of every once in a while getting together to play. But I think something happened really kind of uh, after the pandemic. When we were, you know, I think things sort of changed a bit for everyone. And we really wanted to make a record. And um, and it worked out really well. The songs just sort of came out of, um, I'm not sure where they came from. But <laughs> it was sort of a magical kind of two weeks that we, we had together. Although there is definitely a theme that we found after we finished it, we kind of sat back after a couple of weeks and Keanu, I think, was the first to notice that, that there was a, a thread. Um, um, Keanu, you, you, you so eloquently put it, it's like a, it's like a guy or... A yeah, like this character. I mean, I yeah. feel like, I think, you know, your songwriting, you know, each song has its own individuality and its own story, like it kind of has a beginning, middle, and an end or a context. And uh, yeah, when I was looking at the... The lyrics, it was just, um, it felt like it was from this one point of view, but different versions of the same point of view, like a different, like how we all are, right? We, you know, it was one relationship like this, or there's some, this is one thing I look for, yearn for, this is another thing that happened to me. So it felt like it had a central character, but just different parts of that character in life, emotionally. I guess we were unconsciously shaping a narrative. I guess we did kind of, inadvertently craft a fun record. Hopefully more people take away from it. Who am I putting on the stereo? Friend of mine, this band is cool, the Bobby Lees, some always. Uh, 80s, 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 80s. Just um, quoted Killing Joke. He went, no, 80s, Jesus <laughs> and Mary Chain. Ooh, here you go. That album threw the top the of my head off. Just like Honey. Psycho Candy? Mm, oh my God. That's a great record. Or maybe the play from Cure. Yeah, there's a little big star tip of the hat and the ending piece. And the new ones aren't necessarily like of the time, like today, like 2023. 20, you know, they don't like, oh, we're doing, this is the new thing. They kind of, the tones, and maybe that's Dave Trumfio and all of us together, the producer, it, it sort of tips the hat. It reminds me of like certain parts of the 80s or certain parts of the late 70s, like some of the tones and some Our of the- Our influence. Yeah. Now, the, uh, the only artist to so far make two of these specials uh, is Suki Waterhouse. She was part of the 700th episode special. 
And uh, brought her back for this one because I was so excited that not only did she have new music when we talked about this earlier in the year with her latest single, To Love, uh, but we finally got to talk about the runaway success of her portrayal in Daisy Jones and the Six. It's been one of the biggest shows of the year. It's been one of my favorite shows of the year. So we got to dive into that and a whole lot more in it. Uh, Here's a flashback to Kyle Meredith with Suki Waterhouse. I think Daisy sort of gave me like a sort of gift, like as an artist, it was, it was more about putting myself inside of the character. And we basically had like on hand studio time. We literally had Sound City to ourselves. Like we could go there whenever we want. So it kind of gave me like, you know, like maybe like not every day would we be doing Daisy Jones songs. We'd start working on like my stuff or like, you know, we just, it's like you have so many hours per day of, you know, you kind of like go off course of your homework, I suppose. And uh, yeah, you think about the the importance of the of music for my character, Karen. Like I'd been writing so much and always making music, but just there was something kind of like still sort of holding me back from coming to completion or like, you know, actually finishing a record or it wasn't to do with like doing the work because I had the, had the music ready. It was, it was something like more psych- psychological. And I think, I think the show, yeah, subconsciously helped me like break that, break that down. I don't know. We still all talk on the group chat constantly. We're still like all, you know, like speaking about whether or not we could do a show together there's been like a lot of conversation around that. Like people like really want us to go on tour. <laughs> there's like, there's been so much like talking about that. And uh, we did some rehearsal time recently. So everyone got back together recently to, to rehearse. I think Scott said it in an interview, but it's like the hardest thing is, and you get like, you know, like <laughs> everyone who's like, yeah, I guess m- moved on in the fact that like everyone has to like work and has other jobs now. And like, is that possible to, to make that happen i don't know i don't know if it's like the right thing but i think we will do we have to like do a show at some point i think that's definitely gonna happen but yeah we're not we're not that moved on from it in a weird way we're like very i don't know we had like so much anticipation about the show coming out and like we've just like the amount of work we put into it and like how many years of our lives we've spent together at this point we're just very like bonded in a way that is quite unusual I, th- I think every now and then I feel I feel like this kind of like kind of stompier Debbie Harry like whole sort of thing kind of comes out and that like kind of garbage or th- just just like want yeah wanting to do something that feels feels like harder and more Neon Signs was a song that I'd had a rap like I I made that song years and years ago I love being pulled back to it I it, you know it, it it changes the way that you see the song when suddenly people have ascribed all this new meaning to it. I'd had that song as like part of the songs that I would show people all the time and like, you know, no no one really like thought that much of that song ever. Yeah, it's funny. It's like I I love that that part where you, where you, when I kind of been like listening to a lot and people appreciate it more and then you're like, Yeah, you know what, that is a good song. I don't know. It's it's it's, it's kinda of interesting how the feeling around them can just suddenly change and shift and yeah. And we'll be right back right after this. Welcome back. It's Kyle Meredith with the 800th episode. A big moment earlier in the year was when Rob Lowe dropped by. He had uh, just released a Netflix film called uh, Dog On that we got to talk about. But of course, I used the opportunity to talk about some of his favorite artists that included Simon and Garfunkel and Bruce Springsteen. We got to dip into his characters in West Wing, the greatest show of all time, and uh, 911 Lone Star, which has been keeping him busy these last few years as well. So here's uh, a look back at Kyle Meredith with Rob Lowe. I, I do. I mean, I've, I've li- you're right. I've lived almost every chapter of growth, not only uh, uh, on camera, but through the characters and, um, and just talking about music. I'm, always, I'm a huge Springsteen fan. And one of the things I love about Bruce is he, he writes about what he's going through mm-hmm. and that's what speaks to him. And so to play in Dog Gone, a, a father having a son who's now out of college and has and got to figure out his life. That's what I live. That's what I was living then. And, so it just completely resonates in a, in a way for me that's real. 
and means something. It means something to me. And if you can get to that place, start from that place. As an actor, half the work is done. I mean, there was, there was a, I, I did a movie called Bad Influence with James Spader. It, it, it's um, very well re uh, received, but not a hit at all. Um, I would love to do a sequel of that character. Um, you know, like I said, Eddie Nero, Californication. I, I would, I, I love that character. Um, Sam Seaborn, West Wing. I will always play him. We, we did a reunion, I think, for HBO Max last year. That was super fun. Um, there are just some that are timeless. You know, there's some that you just feel, you're always going to feel connection to. And you're always going to feel like, it's just so fun to do. Doing the podcast is so f fun for me. I love talking to people, but like having Jan on is why I do it. Because I get yeah. to nerd out. And because I'm a music of, of a certain era. Mm -hmm. I'm a music nerd. When I had Lindsey Buckingham on from Fleetwood Mac. Like when I get to do the, the music, John Fogarty I had on. I, I, lo I love that. And, and Jan's book is amazing. And he was a great guest. Well, here I am surrounded by posters of R.E.M. and Bowie, and and I'm listening to you all talk, and my only addition in that was, you know, you you all were hitting on the Central Park show with Simon and Garfunkel, and um, I, I know this is blasphemous, but I prefer the Paul Simon solo in Central Park uh, that came out about 10 years later. That, um, Ooh. Is, but, is, yeah. that the, is that the one where there's the, the amazing version of Only Living Boy in New York? When, when, when the when he sings Sounds of Silence at the end and the whole crowd erupts and the 10,000 people may be more aligned, like hair raising. It's oh, mm -hmm. I got the I got the I got the good. OK, <laughs> I know I'm going to be YouTube in tonight. <laughs> Pulling into the home stretch on this eighth hundreds eighth hundredth episode. A lot of THs together in that one. Uh, here of Kyle Meredith with uh, Monica Bellucci stopped by back in uh, in January, around the same time that Rob Lowe was here. And she was promoting her portrayal of Maria Callas, uh, the famed opera singer. Uh, and uh, and Monica was doing a, uh, a one-person show where she would uh, sort of reenact and read the letters of Maria Callas. So we got to talk about that. We got to talk about her uh, movie Mafia Mama with Tony Collette. We got to talk about The Matrix. Come to think of it, her and Keanu on the same episode, a little Matrix thing going here. Uh, so here's our look back at my interview with Monica Bellucci. But our opportunity to come to you, you know, it's easy to make choices when the opportunity come and uh, uh, to play those women. But at the same time, uh, Anita Ekberg and Maria Callas, they were in the same period of time, if we think about it, you know. Uh, women in a men's world, some way. So they were fighters. And I think that women today learn a lot from a, a women like that. Even Maria, she was a fighter because she wanted to divorce in a moment where divorce was forbidden in Italy. And um, also she had the courage to, to follow her heart. And um, uh, not many women have the possibility to live life with such a strong emotion. And uh, and so when people say that she had a tragic life, maybe we should say that she led a brave life. Uh, but, um, I mean, of course, um, uh, some operas, yeah, of course, like La Tosca, La uh, you know, all those incredible Norma Tosca, all those incredible uh, operas. And the one I was uh, hearing all the time before going uh, on scene was Carmen. And there is one special Carmen that she, um, she represents in Hamburg. Uh, and she was incredible at that moment, not just because she was a great, incredible performer, but also because I could feel a, a woman in love. So she was full of energy. And when, when she's singing this Carmen, this special one, uh, really, uh, she gave me so much energy, and that's why uh, I used to love to hear these colors before going on on scene. Because 
was just, um, you know, so alive, so full of emotion, and she was fire. I think the way how you pose your voice, because even though you don't sing, but you have to give an emotion, a strong emotion. So the way how you project the voice, the way how you represent the different period of time, uh, because actually in the beginning, I mean, as I said, um, in the play, we depict more Maria than Callas. So we represent diff different parts of our life. So even the voice is changing during the show because in the beginning, she's very young, uh, full of hope, discovery of success and everything. And then uh, there is her maturity uh, tainted with the difficulty of finding a balance between her work and her private life. And then the last year of, last years of her life where uh, she handled her melancholy with extreme elegance so you know uh, the voice uh, changed all the time and so it becomes voices like music you know in, in another way but you project a sound and uh, and people they need to to feel something through your voice so it's an instrument not like you're singing, but is an instrument, an instrument anyway. And we're going to end with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, Arnold was on back in uh, in May and had just done his very first TV series for and it was for Netflix. It's called a uh, Fubar. So of course we got to talk about what that was like, how that had ties to his movie True Lies from the '90s. We got to talk about '80s action heroes. We got to talk about how politics might affect action movies, uh, all that and more. So uh, finishing up our 800th episode, it's Kyle Meredith with Arnold Schwarzenegger. It takes sometimes a lot of time to get people convinced that it would be a good uh, idea to do a TV series uh, based on true lies. As much as it has been difficult for me to convince them to do a series on Conan, the Barbarian, or on Twins. I think all of those would be great ideas for a TV series. It's just that sometimes it takes a long time to convince people. But I think the time has come where TV series became really hip to do. And now a lot of you know great actors are wanting to be involved in the TV series. While you're shooting this uh, TV series, you maybe do two movies. And you play two different characters. Here you have to just stay on being the same character for a longer period of time, but in many different ways, under many different circumstances, more so than in a movie. I think it was a lot of fun to do that. And it was, even though it was hard work, but we had a great time, and I was very fortunate to have a really great cast. It was always about discipline and about having a very clear vision where I want to go. That's what made me be able to do what I did. I had a very clear vision when I was a kid to be a bodybuilding champion. I had a very clear vision of that I wanted to come to America, getting in the movies and being rich and famous. You know, that, that was it. That was the dream. You know, and, and, but I mean, that all sounds kind of like, uh, okay, um, how are you going to figure out doing that? And it, through discipline and through believing in what you do and in your vision, it was possible to do. And uh, it's no different than Bruno, the character that I play in our TV series. It's like a guy that is really committed. His vision is to save the world and to protect this country from evildoers. And so he's totally committed to that, except where the comedy comes in is because when he comes home to his family, every, all his talents and his power and everything falls apart and he has to deal with the everyday stuff that everyone in the family has to deal with. This whole development was a big surprise, I have to tell you. That, and I think it has something to do with that Reagan was such a force, you know, and I think that he brought along with him not only very interesting policies and bringing America back and off the stuff and become a military power again, but we did not know that this also had an effect on the movie industry and that the big action heroes uh, would become such a big part of this whole thing. Then in the 90s, then the press 
Canada wanted to unwind this whole thing. And that was artificial, you know, because in reality, people still were interested in action movies. So they tried to write negative stuff, like kind of the, the Reagan era is in, the Bush era is out, the Clinton era is in, it's now much more the, the gentle hero. They tried to destroy uh, a last action hero because they said, well, the action hero doesn't work anymore. And they literally destroyed it before they ever saw it. But then they had to eat it because when the true lies came out, you know, they went through the roof again and it was one guy fighting, you know, the villains and all that stuff. So I think that politics has something to do with it. But you can't go and start making movies based on that. You know, so that, that would be crazy. And there you have it. A sampling of uh, the last 100 episodes that make up this 800th episode special. Thanks, as always, for checking out the series. Thanks for keeping us uh, uh, on the air, as we say, on the podcast air or the uh, the video air, whatever that means to you. However you however you receive this into your brain, I really do appreciate you listening. Uh, it's multiple times a week for a lot of you guys. Reaching out, I always love the comments that I'm hearing from you guys on uh, the social medias uh, and etc. Keep them coming. I'll keep the interviews coming as well. So thanks to all of my artists, all 800 episodes, which actually adds up to more than 800 guests because I've had uh, episodes with multiple guests on them. So thanks to all 800 plus of the guests and especially thanks to you for checking out the series. If you're not already, I do hope you hit that subscribe button so you can keep up with everything that we put out every single week. Again, it's a new one every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at Spotify and uh, Apple Podcasts. You can grab us at NPR, WFPK.org, YouTube for the video versions, or anywhere you get your podcasts from, you can subscribe to Kyle Meredith with. After you do that, head over to WFPK.org, where I do a show Monday through Friday, starting at 6 p.m. Eastern. You get song premieres, you get music news. We do some big anniversaries celebrating the big birthdays of some of our favorite albums from over the past 50 years. Uh, bonus interviews as well. Again, that's Monday through Friday, starting at 6 p.m. Eastern at wfpk.org. Consequence has your music and film news. You can find me on the social media spots. Uh, all of them, anywhere that uh, there's a social media spot. The address is at Kyle Meredith. So I do hope you like and follow along. And that does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith, and I'll see you next time. Consequence Podcast Network. It's easy to hear your favorite artist on WFPK from wherever you are. Listen on your smart speaker, live stream from our website at WFPK.org from Louisville Public Media.